November 12, 2022, 9 p.m., approximately seven hours before the killings, Zana Kernodal and her boyfriend Ethan Chapin are at the Sigma Chi Fraternity House, University of Idaho. It's just a five-minute walk from Zana's off-campus residence at 1122 King Road, Moscow. Just a few hours later, this house would turn into a crime scene. Meanwhile, the other two victims, Madison Mogan and Kaylee Goncalves, are about 1.5 miles away at a local bar called The Corner Club, located at 202 N Main Street around 10 p.m. At around 1.30 a.m., they both decide to leave The Corner Club and head to a local food vendor called The Grub Truck at 318 South Main Street. They can be seen on a live stream on Twitch run by the food truck around 1.40 a.m. This footage is approximately 2 hours and 20 minutes before the event. After spending about 10 minutes there, they take a ride back home and reach the King Road residence around 1.56 in the morning. Zana and Ethan arrived just a few minutes earlier, around 1.45 a.m. About 10 miles away from the King Road residence, and nearly an hour later, police suspect Brian Koberger was observed on Washington State University surveillance cameras, traveling north on Southeast Nevada Street at 2.44 in the morning, about one hour and 15 minutes before the event. His phone stops reporting to the network at 2.47 a.m. Around six minutes later, he is seen traveling south towards State Route 270. He is then spotted on the 700 block of Indian Hills Drive in Moscow at approximately 3.26 a.m., nearly 40 minutes before the event. Two minutes later, he is seen on Steiner Avenue, just a mile away from the King Road residence. 3.29 a.m. Brian Koberger enters the King Road neighborhood, but he does not enter the King Road residence until around 4.04 a.m. Instead, he makes three initial passes around the King Road residence and then leaves via Walenta Drive. It's uncertain where he went from this point, but a car similar to the suspect's car is spotted by the mobile gas station camera around 3.45 a.m. Although the police collected footage from the gas station, but there is no mention of such footage in the affidavit released by the authorities. 4 a.m., back at the King Road residence, just minutes before being killed, Zana Kernodal receives a DoorDash delivery. 4.04 a.m., four minutes later, Brian Koberger enters the King Road neighborhood for the fourth time. He turns east onto Queen Road, but upon failing to park, he turns around and heads west towards the intersection, where he completes a three-point turn and parks somewhere in this area. Around this time, the suspect enters the King Road residence through a ground-level sliding door on the second floor. He takes the stairs to the third floor, goes down the hall, and checks Kaylee's bedroom, where he finds Kaylee's dog. The surviving roommate, Dylan Mortensen, on the second floor, is awoken by what sounds like Kaylee Goncalves playing with her dog on the third floor. Just a while later, she hears what she thinks is Kaylee Goncalves saying, quote, There is someone here. Dylan looks out of her room but does not see anything. Around this time, the suspect goes to Madison's bedroom and kills her and Kaylee with a knife. Four twelve a.m. At this moment, Zana Kernodal is possibly awake, as her cell phone records show she was using TikTok around the same time. The suspect goes downstairs and enters Zana's bedroom. Around this moment, Dylan Mortensen hears crying coming from Zana Kernodal's room. She also hears a male voice saying something to the effect of, quote, It's okay. I'm going to help you. Dylan opens her door for the second time but does not see anything. 4.17 a.m. A security camera less than 50 feet away from the west wall of Kernodal's bedroom picks up distorted audio of what sounds like a whimper, followed by a loud thud. Zana and Ethan are most likely killed around this time.
Dylan Mortensen opens her bedroom door for the third time, and this time she sees a man dressed in black, wearing a mask, walking towards her. She stands frozen in shock as he walks past her and leaves through the kitchen's sliding window. After seeing this man, she locks herself in her room. She does not recognize the man but later describes him as tall, around 5'10", not very muscular, and with bushy eyebrows. However, she does not call the police at that time. 4.20 a.m. The suspect goes back to his car and leaves the crime scene at a high rate of speed via Walenta Drive. But this is not the end of his journey. Approximately three hours and thirty minutes after getting back to his residence, Steptoe Village Apartments, Koberger goes to the crime scene again. According to cell phone records, at 9 a.m. on the very same day, Koberger leaves his apartment. Twelve minutes later, he is back at the King Road residence. His phone utilizes the cellular resources that provide coverage to the King Road residence for another nine minutes before he returns to his place at 9.32 a.m. Sometime later in the morning, the two surviving roommates call friends to the home, thinking that one of their roommates has probably passed out and isn't waking up. Eventually they call the police, nearly eight hours after the event. 11.58 a.m. Police respond to the 911 call reporting an unconscious person and soon find the bodies of four students stabbed to death. On a bed next to Madison Mogan, police find a leather knife sheath with a single source of DNA. That DNA is run through the law enforcement database, but no matches are found. Investigators then turn to genetic genealogy to acquire a family tree with the help of the FBI. Meanwhile, investigators continue to search for leads. They find a suspicious white Hyundai Elantra caught on camera around the crime scene at the time of the event. On November 25th, police ask other law enforcement agencies to look out for white Hyundai Elantras. Four days later, on November 29th, Washington State University police researches any white Elantras registered on the campus and find a 2015 white Elantra registered to Brian Koberger. Thirty minutes later, a WSU officer finds a 2015 Elantra at 1630 N.E. Valley Road. Upon running the plates, he comes up with driver's license information showing Brian Koberger, a 6-foot, 185-pound white male with bushy eyebrows. This description closely matches the description given by the surviving roommate, Dylan Mortensen, who saw him walking past her, leaving the crime scene. Meanwhile, by using genetic genealogy, the FBI comes up with the same suspect. Brian Koberger, a 28-year-old criminology graduate and a Ph.D. student at Washington State University. To test the DNA, police recover trash from Koberger's family in Pennsylvania on December 27. The very next day, the Idaho State Laboratory identifies a male who cannot be excluded as the father of the person whose DNA was found on the knife sheath. On December 30th, the day of the arrest, the FBI and Pennsylvania State Police arrest Brian Koberger in Pennsylvania,